This episode is sponsored by independent Swiss luxury watchmaker Ulysse Nardon. Ulysse Nardon has continuously reset the boundaries of watch engineering and design thanks to its long-established technical excellence and its unconventional approach to watchmaking. To find out more, visit ulysse-nardon.com. That's U-L-Y-S-S-E dash N-A-R-D-I-N dot com. Ulysse Nardon. You're listening to The Luxury Item, the podcast on the business of luxury and the people and companies that are shaping the future of the luxury industry. Here's your host, Scott Kerr. Founded in 2019 by father and son duo CEO Kevin Zinger and COO Lucas Zinger, Los Angeles-based Zinger Vehicles is an industry-disrupting performance vehicles brand pioneering a new era in the automotive space by fundamentally changing the way cars will be designed and manufactured for generations to come. Built around a core ethos of utilizing revolutionary proprietary technology to create vehicles equipped with both dominating performance and iconic design, Zynga represents a radical transformation of the manufacturing sector and the future of human AI design within an environmentally sustainable system. Zinger Vehicle's first production car, the 21C Hypercar, was made using 3D printing technology and was selected as one of Time's best innovations of 2023. 80 units of the 21C were built at a starting price of around $2 million. My guest on the luxury item is Lucas Zinger, who aside from being co-founder of the Zinger Car Company, is also president and COO of Divergent, its manufacturing arm. Lucas joined the family business at the age of 22, and now at 29, he is helping change the future of automotive manufacturing as we know it. Welcome to the luxury item, Lucas. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here, Scott. So glad you can join me. So you and your father, Kevin Zinger, are co-founders of high-performance vehicle designer and manufacturer Zinger Vehicles which is the product company of Divergent Technologies. Both are LA-based companies. The five-year-old Zinger Vehicles has been making a lot of waves in the automotive space about how cars are designed and manufactured with sustainable technology really at its core. So I think a great place to start for listeners is to talk about the parent company Divergent Technologies and how the idea for Zinger Vehicles sprang out of its proprietary automated system for designing and building cars. Absolutely, Scott. And you hit the nail on the head. We did not start as a traditional automaker. We started as a technology business under the name Divergent. And the mission with Divergent was really a very, very large one in terms of scope and overall macro impact. And it was looking at both the auto industry and also the aerospace industry and saying, one, our design engineering is too slow. We're actually not designing the most efficient part and it's too costly. Mm -hmm. And two, our manufacturing methods are outdated in terms of the cost performance, but also, um, or cost productivity, but also the performance of those structures. So we took a blank sheet approach to looking at those core problems in the auto and aerospace industry and said, we are at a time now where compute is powerful enough to integrate generative design and AI into structural analysis and design and create a design software which can take vehicle level requirements and output fully engineered structures in the CAD space. And we have seen the promise of additive manufacturing and essentially what I would call product agnostic manufacturing methods. And we're going to take the base principle of hardware that can create any product set and create a manufacturing method to do so. And in the end, we became a materials company designing our own materials, including aluminum alloys and steels. We became an additive manufacturing company, actually making our own 3D printers and associated process. We became a robotics company, uh, actually coming up with and architecting a design agnostic, product agnostic, Uh, assembly system that we call the vertical assembly cell and integrating that into one system. Um, We now run that system as a TRL-9 qualified system, meaning it's in production in the auto market. We are a tier one supplier, both in engineering service and part supply into various OEMs. 
and into the majority of the U.S. primes in aerospace and defense. So the revolution here is the ability to design parts that are ready for flight or ready for drive within hours, not months or years, and to materialize those designs on that next generation system, again, in hours and minutes, instead of years of setting up product specific tooling to get to run at rate. Um, that system we spent- Is that the DAP that, system? That is the Divergent Adaptive Production System. Right. And that took over four years to develop the first instance of. So we were what you would call a deep technology business um, funded by um, you know, leading VCs, PE firms, and family offices to develop um, this next generation system. And then four years in, once it was developed, we knew that we would now have the ability to create a differentiated product in the automotive space, a product that would also further the tools and further the innovation that Divergent um, had started with and developed over that four year period. That was really the birth of Zinger vehicles. And it was on the backdrop of in the early days, we were already printing parts, we were already forming chassis um, as test beds for the technology. But now four years in, we actually saw a clear business opportunity and a clear R&D and technology rationale to create the car business. That was also supported by the fact that Kevin, my dad, uh, and myself are huge car fans, are passionate about driving cars, have built cars in the past, and had always dreamed about creating uh, really the ultimate performance vehicle. And in 2020, you introduced to the world the Zinger 21C, which stands for 21st Century. It was your first production car born from your proprietary production system, which you just talked about. And the company said that 21C is the world's first 3D printed hypercar designed by human AI. Mm -hmm. It's a tandem seating arrangement hypercar boasting approximately 1,250 horsepower, goes zero to 62 miles per hour speed in 1.9 seconds, really jaw dropping numbers. Why did you launch with a hypercar when the market is already saturated with them? There are tons of them, many of them with unrecognizable names. It's a great question. For us, it was about showing the ultimate performance of the technology. So we're making a system that is making a better part. And if we broadly define better from a performance standpoint, it's lighter weight, it's stiffer, has better durability in a fraction of the time at a cost point that is more attractive than the rest of the industry. How do you prove that? Well, you put it in an arena that has the heaviest competition. You put it in an arena where cars are directly competing against one another relative to track times. That is how you can prove the performance delta um, of this system as well. So we chose what is an ambitious challenge um, and as you said, crowded market to a certain degree, which was create the ultimate performance car, validate that statement by actually capturing the track records at the most meaningful tracks in the US and internationally. And at the same time, create a hypercar that is going through full FMVSS and crash testing and full California carb for emissions. So we're taking that car through the same certification process that a mass market um, consumer vehicle would go through as well. So we chose both of those to complete in parallel, and that's what the 21C has been able to achieve. It now is the fastest hypercar at Laguna Seca, at Circuit of Americas, at the Goodwood Hill Climb, and it is a regular title, fully homologated street legal vehicle, which I would say none of the hypercar <laughs> makers can make that statement of being both the fastest on the track, but also a regular titled vehicle that has gone through the same processes that say an F-150 would go through from a crash safety and emissions perspective. And when you look at the 21C, it definitely looks like it stepped out of Top Gun Maverick, the sleek futuristic fighter jet. I was reading that the inspiration for the 21C was in fact the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, a spy plane with a top speed of Mach 3.3, when you first sat down with Zinger's chief designer, David O'Connell, to discuss your vision for the 21C, what was conveyed to him? So this is a, a really 
you know, kind of um, big moment for myself and, and completing the circle per se. Uh, when I was a kid, um, I was building models of the SR-71 with my father. Mm -hmm. uh, we always loved planes. And, you know, I remember building my first SR-71 model probably when I was seven or eight years old. For Kevin, my father was always both an inspirational plane, but also Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works team from a business standpoint, from what they achieved over a short period of time, uh, was an inspiration to him. So when we begun in Divergent, we were actually channeling what you would call the operating principles of that early Skunk Works team that created SR-71. And when we started looking at the Zinger vehicle, we had that SR-71 in our mind from both form and function. So very early on with Dave O'Connell, our chief designer, uh, we were insistent on the inline seating. So essentially having the pilot and the co-pilot as you would in a fighter jet, we we're also, or a surveillance plane in, in the case of the SR-71. And we were intent on really creating the highest performing vehicle from a CFD perspective and just a total usable power and power delivery perspective to pay homage to what was and, you know, to most is still considered the highest flying fastest uh, plane in the world. So we told Dave, inline seating, we're going to have form follow function from an aerodynamics perspective, but this car from an A-class perspective also needs to be elegant and timeless. If you look in SR-71 today, that plane is still elegant, timeless, and beautiful in its simplistic shape, in its line language, in how functional it appears. So those were the, the early ingredients. And from a packaging perspective, of course, that inline seating um, was the most significant um, starting choice. That affected our suspension layout. That affected the amount of area we had to package our V8 engine, our transmission. Um, that affected the aerodynamic performance of the car, that narrow frontal surface area, the large area to then do ground effects and aero uh, on the large fender areas of the vehicle. So what, you know, thinking about this, it's your first product. So why does the 21C exemplify your design approach and philosophy that makes a statement about what the Zinger brand stands for? Absolutely. For us, there's a new technology that will change automotive and aerospace, and it's already happening today, to really showcase that transition, that revolution, we wanted to make an iconic vehicle, a vehicle that did not have a near peer. So all elements of it, from the performance side to the styling side, um, should be a step up um, and should be differentiated from the rest of the market. On the performance side, we validated that with the track records we have from a styling side, the one plus one seating is unique to us and is being recognized as a Zinger design element. From an aerodynamic standpoint and an A-class standpoint, as extreme as the vehicle is, there's a timeless nature to that design language. If you look at the number of lines, the number of openings per se, on the body of the 21C, they all have a direction, they all find their start and end across that vehicle, and it's relatively elegant and simplistic in its design language. So we wanted to create something that, as I said about the, the SR-71, is timeless. I'd say a third area um, as well for us was looking at what I would call a unified design theory, looking at not only a class, so the body of the car, the exterior and the interior, which are usually the two um, that are judged from a design perspective, but wrapping in a third pillar. And that third pillar is the chassis or the skeleton of the vehicle. So when you open, say, the deck lid and reveal the engine bay of the 21C, what meets the eye is that organic chassis structure is large parts of that powertrain actually optimized with that design software and manufactured with the DAP system. So we've introduced what I would say for the first time is a holistically designed vehicle, not just exterior and interior, we're bringing the last third to the table as well, which is the design of the chassis. How many man hours did it take to complete a single 21C? On the divergent chassis side, uh, 
our process is nearly fully automated, meaning we're printing parts in hours and we're assembling those chassis parts within minutes using high precision metrology systems and robotics. But once that chassis is complete, the Zinger vehicle's general assembly process, fitting the engine, fitting the interior, the exterior, unique colors for every customer, unique materials on the interior for every customer, that is still artisan level craft. And there's about 700 man hours that go into that general assembly process. How does that compare to other very low production hypercars? I would say it's similar. Um, not knowing the exact hour counts of, of Bugatti and Pagani and Koenigsegg, um, but I would say it's in a similar ballpark. And that's because they also are doing custom interior materials, exterior um, customizations. And um, I'd say we're we're probably slightly more efficient on our general assembly side, but it's probably within the same ballpark. Where we're highly differentiated is on the chassis design and manufacturing where we can do it in a fraction of the time and also iterate. And that iteration is super, super important to understand for how 21C has been a success. When we go out to the track, test the vehicle, get input on our suspension geometry, our chassis stiffness, our vehicle dynamics, we can iterate, make a fundamental change, make a new suspension part, make a new rear frame, front frame within single digit days. That iteration was also absolutely key to the outstanding crash performance that the 21C exhibit. So on the chassis side, a fraction of the time and that iteration within days instead of months has unlocked a lot of the vehicle's performance and that carried through our powertrain development as well. But then on the general assembly side, what we have is what I would call a state of the art facility, um, but similar in terms of man hours on the general assembly side to um, the other hypercar players. So how many vehicles did you produce of the 21C VMAX? We, <clears throat> we're making 80 vehicles total. Mm -hmm. um, we have the first two customer cars complete. Um, we've got our next four customer cars in build right now. So we're starting um, our initial ramp. We'll deliver the majority of that 80 run next year and then we'll deliver the final units in 2026. So it's about a little under a two year um, delivery cycle here. And it's a very, very exciting time in that we've um, completed the first two customer cars and you know next three, four are in the line right now. And we've sized our facility to be able to complete um, up to one car per week. So you take those 600, 700 man hours of general assembly time, divide them across your station count. And with the space we have, with the processes we have, we can then complete 121C every week. Can you talk about what's in the pipeline over the next five years? Absolutely. This, this is the start of Zinger Vehicles. There's a deep technology base. Um, you know, we are one company with Divergent. We've raised um, over $700 million. We've got 16 active aerospace and defense programs, six OEMs that we work with. So there is history. There's a lot of creation, but 21Cs are just going on the road now. This is our first model. And what we're here to be is America's performance luxury brand in the automotive space. So of course, that means we are going to make more cars and segment leading cars we're going to stay in the hypercar and supercar space for the foreseeable future. Um, that is based on the R&D spend that we want to put into each of these vehicles, the new systems we want to create, and the performance um, that Zinger vehicles will always embody. So to us, um, it will be a very focused, um, what you would call car two development, which is already underway now and a car three development, and both of those will be in the hypercar, supercar segment. Now, Aston Martin, McLaren, Mercedes-Benz, and other major auto OEMs use Divergent Staps platform to generate, print, and assemble components for their own next generation of supercars. It's like you're their silent digital manufacturing arm. These marks, you know, technically they kind of compete with you. So is this one of those frenemies type of partnerships? I'd say for us, you know, the automotive arena is a, a pretty small one. Um, we know all these players. We know them all at, at the chief level across these businesses. Um, they're much larger than Zinger vehicles today. 
Um, so I don't think they view us as a direct business competitor. At the same time, they've actually seen the performance of the 21C, and that's accelerated our adoption with those players. So actually being able to share data from the 21C, being able to um, show the vehicle and show its performance has actually proven to those OEMs the benefits of the technology. So um, to me, Zinger has actually been a great aid in helping win divergent business. Um, and our relationships with those OEs are very, very strong, and they see the value add through divergence technology. So although, you know, in select occasions, there there's competition on the track, um, we don't view them as com competitors from a business standpoint. What about non-automotive space? We in the non-automotive with... space, the, the 21C is viewed as um, a complex system that has been commercialized with a new technology. So for the primes that we work with, they view it as um, a great positive. The U.S. government also likes dual-use technology systems. Um, they see you know, that that is a direct commercial application in 21C and in the auto OEMs that we work with. So it's viewed very favorably from both our prime customers and the U.S. government directly. You announced the formation of a global dealer network to compete with renowned car manufacturers on the retail front. How many locations in the United States and internationally do you have? We're up to 16 dealers total. Um, the majority of those are in the U.S. Uh, we've really been highly selective about our partnerships because this is a young brand. Our dealers are an extension of our sales and service team. We've chosen to go with a dealer network because we want our customers to have the best possible ownership experience. So buying the car from the trusted interface showroom uh, that they're used to dealing with and then servicing the car um, at the dealership close to their home uh, that they are used to servicing their vehicles with. So that dealer network um, is really in place to make sure our customers have the best ownership experience. But within that, as an extension of the Zinger brand, we've been very, very selective. And you'll see that the, the dealers in the U.S., the Miller Motors, the Ogaras, the Prestige, the Boardwalk Group, uh, these are really the top supercar and hypercar dealers in existence today. They've got the right staff, the right experience, the right showrooms, and the right service centers to take care of the Zinger customers as well. The potential investment gains of hypercars are attracting the attention of the ultra-wealthy, the opportunity to be part of an exclusive group of owners insured by limited edition hypercars can be a status symbol for many and their value can increase over time. So is collectability a factor when you designed the 21C or any other you know, future vehicles? In the design of it, no. Um, but in a, the practical business sense of it, yes. Um, meaning when we're designing the vehicle, we went after a set of performance and styling attributes that we felt were representative of the Zinger brand. But when we priced the vehicle and when we set the limited volume run, it was an understanding that the first customers of Zinger are pioneers with us, are supporting the business, and therefore we should be doing everything in our power to also protect their investment and enhance their investment in 21C. So capping it at 80, significantly below what is typical for a hypercar run, which is usually in the mid hundreds, um, we've really restricted the volume. On the price point, we're starting the car at 2 million MSRP, which yes, that's a lot of money for a vehicle, but that is low compared to its peers when you compare performance um, and specification of the vehicle. So the potential gains, of course, are also higher with that lower starting point. And that means from a volume standpoint, from a cost standpoint, this is a very attractive vehicle to collectors. And then lastly, this is the first vehicle to fully embrace a completely new technology system. And as that technology goes cross industry and proliferates, you will remember the 21C as both Zinger's halo car, but also as the first car to embrace that tech. So yes, to me, this will be one of the most collectible cars in the world. And certainly some of our buyers who host some of the largest and best collections in the world, I've had that same feeling. And that has led also, frankly, to their rationale for buying the vehicle. 
Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about the demographics of your perspective bias. I'm sure these rarefied consumers are in the upper echelons of global wealth and aren't impacted by economic challenges. Perhaps they're already playing in the $1 million, $2 million vehicle playground. How do you position yourself to these ultra wealthy individuals when you're this new to the scene and you're unproven and you're competing against car brands with iconic heritage and illustrious racing histories? It's all about genuine facts in our opinion. So the reason why we launched the car business after having developed the technology business to a certain degree was so that we would have the funding and the operating uh, abilities in place to do Zinger vehicles the right way, to have the, the funds to spend on the program in the right way and to scale at the right rates. So with that, we were able to create a record-breaking car, which validated the performance. We're able to have our dealer network experience the car to the point where they wanted to represent the brand. And then we're able to invite and gain the attention of what I would say are really key players in the automotive collecting space and racing space uh, that own vehicles in this segment. Um, over the last three years, the brand has grown stronger. We've sold the majority of the 21 Cs already. And we've also been validated by the programs that we've picked up in aerospace and with other OEMs with the technology stack. So from a competition standpoint, I would say we're very, very grateful to have the genuine facts on our side that those sophisticated customers understand and then be able to directly invite them to also see our facility, to experience the car, to talk with our dealers, and to ultimately give them the conviction, the confidence, and excitement to become an owner. In the last decade, 3D printing has made its way into the fashion industry. We've seen additive manufacturing playing an increasingly central role in a variety of innovative efforts. Louis Vuitton, Christian Dior, Balenciaga, Bulgari, and others have embraced 3D printing in one form or another. Could Divergence DAP system ever be applicable to the design, assembly, and manufacturing of luxury goods, or does it exist just for creating complex structures like auto chassis components? We see our focus around, I'd say, industrial structures broadly. So if it's a metal part, a composite part, a load-bearing part, we should be engineering it and manufacturing it with the Divergent production system. We really deal primarily with metal alloys like aluminum, steels, and exquisite materials like hypersonics materials. Um, we are unlikely to go into the 3D printing of plastics or near similars for um, the fashion industry or the luxury good from a consumer um, standpoint. So we are definitely squarely focused on structures, engineering, and production, but cross industry. And you can think of anything that has um, a real load case, a real structure um, requirement to it that should be designed and manufactured by Divergent. So certainly outside of just auto and aerospace and defense, there's applications, but I wouldn't go as far to, to stretch that into fashion today. The 3D printing revolution has been talked about for the last decade. Companies are switching to it for industrial production at scale. As the range of printable materials continues to expand, more companies are following. However, it still hasn't gone mainstream yet. What Zinger is doing, creating a 3D printed car in production, is certainly revolutionary. But what will it take for 3D printing to actually move beyond niche status? For us, we made an early decision, which is to really industrialize and proliferate this technology. You have to own that system end to end, and you have to sell that end product, which means added manufacturing 3D printing is only one slice of the solution. You need the design software, you need the factory management software, you need the materials themselves, both alloys, but also adhesives. You need the 3D printing machine and you need the interstitial process automation and the robotic assembly process. When you have all of those, then you can create the product that is differentiated, higher performing, lower cost, faster to market, and faster per unit in production. That is what Divergent has spent its eight years unlocking and creating. And within that, we have advanced leaps and bounds in every segment of that solution. So to look at 
3D printing specifically, for example, when I began, we were printing at about 20 milliliters per hour. Now we are printing in production at about 250 to 300 milliliters per hour, complex structure geometry. And our next generation machine is going to be printing at about three times that rate, over 700 milliliters per hour with a machine that's a fraction of the price of our current machine. So even over the last seven years, I've seen additive go from useful maybe for prototyping and the most select production applications, but certainly not industrialized to going 30 times faster and divergent really leading that charge of getting onto production platforms in automotive and aerospace and defense. All pieces of that system need to come together and each individual element of that system needs to progress um, in a significant manner. We've seen that progression 20 to 30 X in additive. We're gonna continue to push that. And over the next decade, I believe you'll see Divergent distribute these manufacturing factories all over the US and internationally, and really bring this technology into the mass market. Your co-founder slash father, Kevin Zinger said in an interview, we don't do normal. We always want to push the boundaries. So what boundaries are you pushing next? Oh, I think we, we push the boundaries in just about every one of our engineering and manufacturing systems and the vehicles that we've chosen to create. So in terms of our R and D projects, we're pushing the boundaries of physics on what is possible in terms of rates and performance. We're pushing um, the boundaries of operating excellence in terms of what our factories can achieve on an overall utilization basis and OEE basis. And then on the vehicle performance side, we're pushing the boundaries of what was thought to be possible in terms of track performance, in terms of vehicle dynamics, in terms of um, aerodynamics, in terms of power delivery and packaging to ultimately create the fastest and most technologically advanced vehicles year after year after year. And that's really the important word is it's a continuous breaking of boundaries. We are continuing to progress that system. We are continuing to design and manufacture new vehicles into the future. So Lucas, my final question is the luxury item question, which I ask all my guests. So if you were stranded on a deserted island and you could only have one single luxury item with you, what would that luxury item be? It can't be any form of air or water transportation, or you can't have an amphibious version of a Zinger vehicle pick you up or anything that requires mobile service so you can call somebody to pick you up off that island. It's just you, your lonely self on this deserted island. What would the one single luxury item you would like to have with you? Huh. Well, if ground transportation is an option, I would say a 21C to put a big smile on my face. <laughs> and 21C to have at least a, a few more smiles before my eventual demise <laughs> on that lonely <laughs> island. <laughs> Lucas Zinger, COO and co-founder of Zinger Vehicles. Thank you so much for joining me on The Luxury Item. Thank you so much, Scott. Really appreciate it. That's it for this episode of The Luxury Item Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this useful and entertaining, I would be really grateful if you can share it with a friend or colleague. I would love it if you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other listeners find us. The Luxury Item Podcast is a production of Silvertone Consulting. I'm your host, Scott Kerr. Until next time.